Amen. Come on, who's excited to be in the house tonight, today? Well, hey, we're so excited that you're here with us. My name is Pastor Jess. I am one of the young adults pastors here at Discovery, and it is my honor and my privilege to be able to serve on the pastoral team here. And before I get into the word, I would just love for us to be able to honor our lead pastors, Pastor Jason and Veronica. Come and give them a hand. For them to share the stage and to empower um, the next generation pastors um, to share the word. Man, we're so spoiled. We have pastors who love you, who are so devoted to, to walking you through what the call of God is on your life. So we're just so grateful for them. We're blessed. But hey, in these next few minutes um, that I have with you this morning, I want to share with you the power and the weight that your yes to God can have. And I want to reveal to you today what kind of impact that your yes to the will of God can do. And you see, I believe that saying yes to God is not just a one-time occurrence but it's a continual act of surrender. Our yes to God is a continual willingness and obedience to the Lord. And if we truly want to live a life that it, God is calling us to, it's going to require you to say yes again. And that's the title of this devotion today, if you're taking notes, is yes again. And we'll be looking at someone significant in the Bible who I believe she has shown through her life and through her actions what it looks like to say yes again to God. And her name is Esther. And now before we dive into the life of Esther, I want to give you a bit of historical and cultural context in the time period that Esther was living in. So with Esther, um, she's living in the time period of the Persian Empire that is at its height of its power. And the Jews have been exiled from their homeland, and they've become a minority group. And Esther is a Jew, so she is a part of that minority group. And not only is she a Jew, but she is a young woman, and she is an orphan. So right off the bat, this puts her at a vulnerable position in society. But how many of you know that God could use anyone? And we're going to see right here in this story how God uses Esther and how she's faithful to say yes to God every step of the way. And we're going to see her yes journey. And now if you're taking notes, this first part of the yes journey is the initial yes. And we see that Esther's initial yes found in Esther chapter 2 verse 16 it says that Esther was taken to King Xerxes at the royal palace in early winter of the seventh year of his reign. And the king loved Esther more than any other young woman. He was so delighted with her that he set the royal crown on her head and declared her queen instead of Vashti. So here in this scripture, you see that Esther, a young woman, a Jew, is crowned queen over Persia. That the king has found favor in her. And she is queen and she steps into it and she says, yes, yes, God, I will be queen. Yes, Lord, I will say yes to that. This is her initial yes to God. And I want to ask you, church, what is your initial yes to God? If you can think back, what is that yes that you've said to God? Is it yes to pursue your calling? Yes to pursue the assignment that God has placed on your life? Is it a yes to sobriety? A yes to, to find healing and freedom from addiction? Yes to, to, to find healing from past wounds? Yes to being a light in the workplace? What is your initial yes? And there comes a point that after our initial yes, that that yes will get tested. Your yes will be put to the test. And that leads me to the second point is the test of yes again. And we see Esther and she is operating as a queen and her cousin Mordecai comes to her and tells her that her people, the Jews, are going to face a mass annihilation and they're going to be destroyed. And he urges Esther to confront her husband, the king, and to plead and beg for mercy for the Jews. Now keep in mind, he, the king does not know she is a Jew. So this is something very courageous that Mordecai is asking Esther to do. And we also hear, though, that Esther, in Esther 4.11, 
gives a reason as to why she's a little reluctant to go to the king. And it says, all the king's officials, even the people in the provinces, know that anyone who appears before the king in his inner court without being invited is doomed to die unless the king holds out his gold scepter. So here Esther is explaining to Mordecai the difficult decision that she has to make because she cannot approach the king unless he invites her to approach him. So this is something difficult that Esther is facing, and this is the test in her initial yes. And we'll see that Esther's faithfulness to her calling is being tested, and it's going to require her to say yes again. And I, it, this got me thinking, church, how many times that we might say an excuse or a circumstance as to why we can't say yes to God again. Maybe you're saying the calling is harder than I thought it would be. Saying no to the culture of the world is not as accepted, and it's hard for me. Investing into my marriage is not as easy as I thought it would be. Being a light in the workplace is not as easy. Maybe you've fallen short. Maybe you've messed up, and you feel unqualified to say yes again to God. But can I tell you that your excuse for a yes is not greater than the calling that God has placed on your life? It is not greater. There is no circumstance, no excuse that is greater than saying yes to God, despite however difficult it may be. And we should say yes to God. And in this yes, you'll see in Esther's story that her yes wasn't just going to impact her, but it was going to impact the generations that were present there and the generations to come. And you see Mordecai, her cousin, responds to her, and he says this, if you keep quiet, at a time like this, deliverance and relief for the Jews will arise from some other place, but you and your relatives will die, and who knows if perhaps you were made queen for such a time as this. And when I read this, I thought to myself, in the calling that God has placed on my life, in the assignment that he's placed on my life, I want to say yes to God and not say that deliverance would come from someone else. And I pray that that would be you here today. That maybe in your life, maybe you've been surrounded by alcoholism, or maybe you've, you've seen from gen generation to generation be past addiction, strongholds, bondage. But can I tell you, I, I pray that you would rise up and say, deliverance for the future generations will come through me. It will come through me. It's not going to come through someone else. God, use me however you want. Use me. The calling, the position, the assignment, the family you're in, the workplace that God has placed you in is not for nothing. He has placed you there for such a time as this. And he's placed you there for a specific purpose. And Esther made her choice. And she chose to be bold. And she chose to confront the king. She chose to be courageous and say yes again to God. And the Jews saw relief. They were able to overpower and overcome their enemies. Esther was faithful in the testing of her yes and yes again. And we see in point three, the impact of yes again. And I love this in Esther chapter 9, verse 28. It says, these days would be remembered and kept, can you say it with me, from generation to generation and celebrated by every family throughout the provinces and cities of the empire. This festival of Purim would never cease to be celebrated among the Jews, nor would the memory of what happened ever die out among their descendants. How many of you know that your first yes opens the door, but your Yes, again, it impacts generations. It has the power to impact generations to come. And I love that Pastor Jason, he shared this before. And he said, you don't get to choose what happens to you, but you get to choose what passes through you. And I believe that some of you here today, maybe you've been bound by addiction, bound by alcoholism. Maybe you've had an absent father, absent mother. Maybe you've witnessed failure after failure of broken marriages. Maybe that your family has not been committing to the Lord fully. But can I tell you, church, would we rise up and say that that wouldn't be our legacy? That our legacy would be freedom from addiction, 
freedom from healing, that our legacy would be that we wouldn't choose a counterfeit calling, but we would choose the calling that God has placed on our life. We wouldn't run away when things get difficult, but we would take the rein and say, okay, God, you're going to go before me. You're going to be with me. If you're in it with me, I'm going to step out and I'm going to be bold in my faith and I'm going to say yes and yes again to what you called me to because you're faithful and your plans for my life are good. Come on, how many of you believe that today? His plans for your life are good. So whether you're here in the room today, whether you're 77 or whether you're 17, as long as there's still breath in your lungs, there is still a calling on your life. Listen to me, hear me. As long as there's still breath in your lungs, God still wants to use you. You're not too broken. You're not too messed up. You're not too far gone. God can use your yes. Your yes and your yes again. And as I close out, I would love to pray that for you today. I would love to pray over your yes and your yes again and how it wouldn't just impact you, but the future generations that would come after you. So God, I just thank you. Lord, I just pray for courage, for faith, and for strength to rise up in this room. Father, I pray that we would rise up like Esther and have an obedience a willing heart to say yes to you, to say yes again, Father, even in the midst of difficulty, even in the midst of a trial. God, we recognize that our life is not our own, but we were bought at a price. And Lord, I thank you, Father, for the yes that will impact this generation and the generations to come. We give you our yes and our yes again, all for your kingdom and your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Amen and amen. Come on, give it up for Pastor Jess. What an amazing message there. Come on. So how do I follow up with that, guys? How am I going to, you know, how am I going to follow up? How am I going to come after that one there? So, hey, guys, my name is Pastor Robert. I'm so um, honored and thrilled to be with you here on this Sunday um, morning here. And before we jump into the Devo here, I just want to give a, a few uh, moments to honor our pastors, Pastor Jason and Pastor Veronica, man. They are the best pastors we've seen here. I think in the tower world. I don't know about you, man, but man, I just want to honor them, man. Their, their um, willingness to sow, willingness to learn and grow and see. Um, you live out your God-given calling, man. It's really cool to see. Even behind closed doors, they are the same people that you see them here on Sundays. They love and care for you so, so much. And even with my life as well, you know, when I started coming to Discovery uh, almost 11 years ago, where I'm just this little 17-year-old, you know, have big visions, big dreams. Like, I'm called to be a pastor. I think this is what I'm called to do. And even for Pastor Jason and Pastor Veronica say, okay, I believe in that. Now let's go on a journey together. So thank you so much, Pastor uh, Jason and Pastor Veronica, for believing in the next generation there. Can we give it up for them one more time for their awesome pastors? Cool. Well, today's uh, my Devo is uh, going to be titled The Passing of Greatness. So if you're taking notes here, you can write that in there, The Passing of Greatness. And we're going to take a look at uh, the life of Timothy, um, specifically about him and his family and the passing of greatness that has happened towards Timothy and his life there. And you may be asking, well, I kind of know Timothy, or maybe I don't know Timothy. Maybe you're in here like, I I've heard it. I've heard it in circles with my uh, friends um, and my Bible studies and my small groups. But who is Timothy? Who is this person in the Bible um, that is even, why is he even mentioned in the Bible? Why does he get his own book? You know, why, what, what's going on here? Who is he? Is he a Dodger fan? Is he a Giants fan? Because that'll tell us a lot. But, you know, like, who is this person? So Timothy um, this, in, in this context here, he's, he's a young man. And many scholars say that he was in his late teens, early 20s, so about 18 to 22, around that area there. And um, he's, for someone to be mentioned for that early in, in that stage of their life, they had, to, they had to be doing something right in their life. They had to be doing something right that, that would separate them from the rest of culture and the rest of society. They had to be doing something great. But even so great that the Apostle Paul would take this young man under his wing and even go as far as saying, hey, this is my spiritual son. This is someone I deeply care for. This is someone I deeply, I deeply long for, deeply long to see that, one, that, that would even call my spiritual son. You see, for the Apostle Paul to point this young man out, he had to be doing something right. And to even give it some more weight to it, you know, the Apostle Paul, he was a legend in the faith. You know, I kind of think of it, he was like the Kobe Bryant of the NBA, you know. He's better than Michael Jordan. But uh, yeah, I gotta go. 
I just divided the room here. All right, guys. Some of you are like, no, Michael Jordan's the best one. But my generation, it was, it was really Kobe Bryant that's, you know, that changed in game. Anyway, but uh, crucify me later, guys. All right. <laughs> but even for the Apostle Paul to say, this is my son right here. This is, this is here. Here, Timothy. Because in this context here as well, Timothy's not only young, but he's, he's a leader within the, his church. He's a church planter. He's a pastor. He's, 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 he's leading people to Jesus here. So this is who Timothy is. He's leading people. He's, he's, he's a pastor. So, But what I want to specifically dive in a little more is why did Timothy have such a great faith? For a young person that, to, to know Jesus and to be a spiritual leader in his context, in his culture, why did he have this, this great faith here? And it's found in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 1, verse 5. It's when Paul's writing to him here. He says, Paul says, I am reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois, and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. Did you catch that there? Which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, I am persuaded now lives in you. This great faith, this sincere faith that you have, that I'm seeing you live out, it first came from Lois and his mother Eunice. So I'm here to tell you today, if you, if, you're in, uh, if you have grandchildren or children of your own, you're thinking maybe my, de- my best days are behind me. Can I tell you today that the fact that you're still here and that you have your family here, that you have grandchildren, you have children here, you have the perfect opportunity to pass on greatness to the next generation here. You see... Over the years that God has been teaching you lessons, has been teaching you, has given you revelation, has given you all kinds of wisdom and knowledge, now it is your turn to get this baton that God has given you on. Now pass it on to your children so that they may have a sincere faith, so that they may raise up to be the pastor they were called to be, to be that worship leader they were called to be, to be that missionary they were ever called to be. That, that the, see, the, the calling that God's placed on their life was, was, was given, you know, before birth. Now it's your responsibility now to, to ignite that flame, to see the seed plan and start watering and start encouraging start start letting them know like hey now it's your turn to go pass on this legacy now it's your turn to go live on what God has given you to do and we see that here with Lois and even Eunice his mother that they they pass on this spiritual legacy onto Timothy here see 2 Timothy 3 15 says and how from infancy infancy you've known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus See, write this down. The deep faith that Timothy was able to behold was first beheld by the generation before him. The deep faith that Timothy was able to grasp on was first beheld by his mother and his grandmother. You see, you thought you were going, you see, you you thought your best days were behind you, church. You thought you were over. You thought the assignment was over. You know, I may be 50, 40, 50, 60, whatever it may be. You know, I was leading Bible studies. I was serving on a team back in my, my young days when I was able to bust out 12-hour days, 16-hour shifts. But let me tell you right now, your best days are not over. And you have a recall and a responsibility to start passing on that baton. And just as, as, as the, you know, we just had the Olympics here. Just as in the track meet where, where they would hand off the baton, where, where the next person was running their race and say, here, here you go. Now is your time in your season to say, here you go. Go next generation. Here's what God has taught me. This is what the Holy Scripture says. This is what it means to live for Jesus. This is what it means to be in a small group. This is what it means to wake up Sunday morning before football starts and go to church. This is what it means to serve on a team. This is what it means to give generously. This is what it means to live for Jesus. And this is a call that is so special to you. So do that. Do that because it's so, it's, it's what a blessing it is. What an honor that God would entrust us with that. It is your turn, church, to pass on the baton. But I'm going to leave you with, uh, I'm not going to leave you with that, but I'm going to leave you with t- two key ways that you can pass this baton and really just set an example of godly living. Godly living. And we find it here in 1 Timothy 4.12. It says, when Paul was speaking to Timothy, it says, don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. So the first key here, write this down, is the words you speak. The words you speak either have, they're either going to build up skyscrapers or they're going to destroy skyscrapers. The words, the words, the power of your words are so tremendous and so great. You see, Proverbs 8, 18, 21 says this, the tongue has the power of life and death and those who love it will eat its fruit. So the words you speak through text message, through the phone calls, through emails, whatever it may be, have the power 
of life or death? Now, when we, when we try to, when we live out this godly example, are you, are you, are you passing on life to this next generation? Are you passing on life to other people? Are you passing on life to your supervisor that's really hard, that's very like, oh my gosh, Lord, get them. Are you passing on life to them? Are you passing on life in the grocery store? Or are you passing on death? Are you passing on these, uh, are you passing on other death towards your coworkers or towards your family members or towards the next generation. What words are you speaking, church? What words are coming out of your mouth? Even go as far as even death, even are you, are you gossiping? Are you talking down upon them? What, what, what kind of words are you speaking there? And Paul is saying, be an example in speech because this godly way is going ha- to attract other people and say, well, this is different. This is different. The way this person talks, this is the way the person carries itself is different. So it's either the life or death. What are you speaking, church? And the secret to have great speech, I'm going to give you the secret here, is to feed your mind with these great thoughts. It's to watch, it's to watch what you're watching. You know, what are you watching on Netflix? What are you watching on Hulu or Peacock or whatever it may be? What are you feeding your soul? What are you feeding your own spirit? What's, what are you making deposits in here? Because what's deposited in here is going to go inf- infiltrate your heart and then eventually come out your mouth. So be mindful of what you're feeding yourself. Philippians 4.8 says this, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Think about those, church. And the last point here, number two, to live a godly example is, is you, we got to keep in mind our conduct. To live a godly example, it's in your conduct. Your actions can bring others to know the love of the Father. See, even Jesus has something profound to say when when he's telling people how to live. It's it's found in Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. It says, in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. You see, let your good deeds shine. Let them shine, but not for you to get the glory, not for you to say, look at me, look what I'm doing at Second Outreach or the Second Saturday Outreach or the Fourth Saturday Outreach. I'm, I'm, I'm feeding the homeless. I'm clothing the homeless. No, it's for people to praise the Father in heaven. Yes, we play a role in that. Like, hey, go do the work. Go, go show up for, to serve on a team. Go and show up and change the world. But it's for people. It's for, not for us to get the glory. It's for Father, the Father in heaven to get the glory so they may praise him and come to know him. See, when someone looks at your life and the fruit of your life, they should see a life that is, ble- that is blessing others and building others up. Not just for your glory, but so they may praise God in heaven. So let me conclude with this. No matter what stage of your life you're in, you have a call from God to model what it means to be a God-fearing believer, to pass on this godly legacy that has been trusted to you, church. Let me pray for you, and I'll get out of your hair this Sunday morning. Cool. Heavenly Father, I thank you for it today, God. I thank you for the word that was sent forth, God. May this be a church, God, that sets an example, God, to, be, uh, uh, to live for you, Father. Not only to live for you, but for the spiritual legacy that's going to be passed down to the next generation, God. May the future and pastors, future worship leaders, future missionaries, future disciples, God, be raised up here in your house, God, so that this legacy can carry on from generation to generation. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. 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 Come on, can we give it up for Pastor Robert this morning? Amen. 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 Such an amazing word. If I haven't got the chance to meet you this morning, my name is Cody. I am the youth pastor over our freshmen and sophomores here at Discovery Church. Me and my wife, we actually just moved here about four weeks ago to kind of be under the leadership of Pastor Jason and Veronica and learn under them. Can we give it up for our pastors this morning? Amen, amen. I got 10 minutes today, so we're going to jump right into this. Today, I'm preaching on a subject titled, I'm Living the Dream. Look to your neighbor and say, I'm living the dream. Look to your other neighbor and say, man, I'm so glad to be sitting next to you today. There we go. I'm living the dream. In the Bible, it talks about this man named Joseph. And in Joseph's story, just to sum it up real fast, um, Joseph was given dreams by God that one day his family was going to bow at his feet. And he told his family about his dreams, and his family didn't like it, so they despised him because of this. And what we see is Joseph's brothers were actually going to kill him, but they sold him to be a slave. And we see throughout Joseph's story is that God stayed faithful to Joseph because Joseph stayed faithful to God. See, but I think with Joseph's story, it could have went a totally different route. Joseph could have believed the lies and the doubt that his family had about his dreams, and he could have stepped into the doubt and stepped out of God's calling. 
See, I think for some of us in our lives, we're in this second place where God has given you a dream, but because someone told you that your dream is impossible, because someone told you that you weren't good enough to fulfill the dream that God placed into your heart, that you stepped into that and you stepped out of what God has called you to do. And there's something I want to get you to understand today, that I'm defined by what I'm aligned with. I'm defined by what I'm aligned with. With If I align myself with God, then what starts to happen is now I'm letting God define my life. But if I align myself with the world, then what we see is now I'm letting the world define me. And I think this gets into a dangerous thing that we start to, or game we start to play, because what starts to happen is when I'm living for the world and letting the world define my life, all I do is find my identity in worldly things. But what we see with the world is the world will often tell you that you're not good enough. The world will also often tell you that you don't talk good enough, that you don't dress good enough, that you don't have enough followers or likes on social media. The world will tell you these things, and I think we get into this place where the biggest battle we often face is the battle against ourselves. That we get into this moment and this spot that we start to believe what the world says about us. See, I think this happens because if the enemy could get you to not believe in yourself, then the enemy, enemy could easily get you to not believe what God says about you. And we get in this place where we don't believe the truth that God speaks into our life. A while ago, I was at this grocery store, and I was walking out this grocery store, and this Hispanic lady, she comes up to me, and she starts speaking fluent Spanish. And as you all can see, I'm white. <laughs> I don't know how to speak, I barely know how to speak English, y'all, come on. My family, we're so white that when we say, let's go get Mexican food, we go to Taco Bell, okay? <laughs> All the white people confused, like, what? Taco Bell's not Mexican food? No! It doesn't count. But this Hispanic lady came up to me, and she starts speaking fluent Spanish, and I told her the only thing that I know, no habla espanol. She keeps speaking fluent Spanish, and she's pointing and stuff, and I tell her, no habla espanol. Even that sounds white. Um, but she keeps speaking fluent Spanish. Y'all, at this point, I'm convinced that she doesn't even know Spanish. But I remember this story, and what I'm trying to get you to understand is, why did I not understand this lady? It's simple, because we didn't speak the same language. And I think when it comes to our relationship with Jesus, we don't understand God or what he's calling us to do because we're not speaking the language of Jesus. And I believe to speak the language of Jesus, it's simple. Read your word. (laughs) Read your word. I think as Christians, too often we pray this prayer, God, speak to me. God, your servant's listening. We come to worship now. He's at the altar laying our face to the ground. But what happens is we don't dig deeper into God's word. If you want to hear his word, read his word. See, it says in Psalms, it says how our Bible and our word is something that fills our cup to overflowing. And we pray these prayers, God, speak to me. God, fill me up. But the reality is, is our Bible's at home right now and our nightstand being a better cup holder than it is a cup filler. And what we do is we want God to speak to us, but we're not willing to go deeper into his word and who he called us to be. See, there's a study that says that the number one way to trust is through intimacy. And intimacy is this word that means closeness. And I believe when it comes to our relationship with God, if we want to understand God, if we want to trust God, we need to be more intimate with him. We need to be more close with him. Because you're not ever going to trust somebody that you don't know. You're not going to be honest with somebody you don't know. There's always going to be a barrier that you build. And when it comes to our relationship with Jesus, I'm never going to trust him or be honest with him if I don't build this intimacy or this closeness with Jesus. And that comes from reading your word. In Hebrews 4.12, it says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. If you want to decrease your negative talk in life, you need to increase your depth in God. We need to align ourselves with God, with Joseph, no matter what happened in his life. 
No matter if his family sold him to be a slave. No matter if Joseph got put into prison for something he didn't do. What do we see with Joseph? He stayed faithful to God. Why? Because he was aligned with God. And I believe for some of us today, we need to learn to align ourselves with God. There's a movement that we have here at Discovery Church called Unstoppable. Where we believe that God will do unstoppable things in your life if you trust and have faith in him. And there's a question that I want to ask you today. Is could it be today that you don't see unstoppable blessing in your life because you have stoppable faith? Could it be today that you're not seeing things happen in your life because you're not having faith for it? For some of us today, we need to stop letting our season dictate our faith and start letting our faith dictate our season. We need to start trusting God a little bit more in who he called us to be. Because the more I trust him and build this intimacy with him, the more I will start to understand God and who he calls me to be and who God is and what he's doing in my life. And even if I'm in a season where I don't fully understand what God is doing and what he's called me to do, one thing I do understand that is that God is faithful. And I understand that God is faithful because there once was a day in my life where I struggled with anxiety and depression, but God gave me joy. I understand that God is faithful because my marriage at one point was at its end and we thought it was over, but God restored my marriage. I understand that God is faithful because there was a day that my mother walked into the hospital room and was told that she had cancer, but one by one the cancer cells started to disappear off the screen in front of the doctor. Come on, how many believe that God is a way maker? Come on, how many believe that God is still in the business of doing miracles this morning? We need to align ourselves with God. Man, I'm living my dream because I'm living with Jesus. And for some of us today, we need to step back into what God has called us to do and keep having on a worldly perspective impossible dreams. Why? Because we have a God who makes the impossible possible. We have a God who makes the stoppable unstoppable. But that takes for us today to put our full identity in who God created us and called us to be. Can we pray this morning? Jesus, we thank you. We worship you today. God, we pray today that we will step into who you called us to be. That today we will start dreaming bigger dreams. That we'll start having bigger visions. That we'll start believing for bigger things because you are an unstoppable God. That you are a God who makes the impossible possible. God, I believe this morning, God, that when we dig deeper into you, when we align ourselves with you, Jesus, I believe that today that marriages will start to be restored. I believe today that sickness will start to be healed. I believe today that negative thoughts in our mind will start to leave. Why? Because we are aligning ourselves with you, Jesus. God, you are who created us. And I pray we start to dig deeper into you. So we start to understand who you called us and created us to be. Jesus, we love you. We praise you. We worship you. And everybody said, hey, what's up, guys? Come on. Hey, can we take a moment real quick to honor our pastors? Don't we have incredible pastors, Pastor Jason and Pastor Veronica? Man, to give us an opportunity to share the stage and just and share with you guys the word of God. And so, man, we have some incredible pastors. But like he said, I'm on a time budget. So we are going to jump in right here. And I want to, tonight, I want to talk to you guys about a man named Samuel. Everybody say Samuel. By the way, I forgot to do this. My name is Pastor Nick. I'm the youth pastor here um, at church. I love being here. I have the honor and privilege of leading the 6th through 12th grade students, and it is my passion for the next generation. And so we're going to share about tonight this guy named Samuel. And, and if you're familiar with this story, man, he's an incredible man of God, and a, a man of God that was a prophet, a priest, the, the judge of Israel, and all these things. Like, he did incredible, incredible things. And not only that, he himself is a miracle. We see um, his mom, Hannah. He himself is a miracle. His mom, Hannah, had a hard time having kids, and so God blessed her out of her desperation and cry out to God for a child. He blessed Hannah with a child named Samuel, and so because of this blessing, she dedicated Samuel to God and said, God, because you have blessed me, because you have moved in my life, because you have done this, I'm going to dedicate this child to you, and so what, what, he, what she did 
was gave Samuel to the church. And so he actually ended up serving under the priest Eli. And so this is what's incredible, because as he went, as he grew, and as he served under the priest Eli, as he served the church, he got the call to be a prophet. He got the call uh, uh, to serve as a judge of Israel, and he ended up becoming an incredible leader, leading the nation of Israel back to uh, spiritual integrity. See, we see Samuel do some incredible things, and, and I want to talk to you guys about the call of God, and what God is doing in your life. But this moment that it starts with, I want to show you what the moment that it starts with in Samuel's life. Because he did incredible things. He led the nation of Israel. He, he was a prophet, was called, and, and knew what God called him to do. But there was a moment before all of those things, before, of, before he became a priest, before he became a prophet, before he led the nation of Israel, there was a moment that defined him, that allowed him to do the next things. And I want to talk to you guys about that today. I want to talk to you guys about the moment when Eli heard the voice of God. If you have your Bibles, will you turn with me to 1 Samuel 3, 2. We're going to read this. We're going to read a little bit of his story when he first experienced and heard the voice of God. It says this, one night, Eli, who was, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the house of the Lord where the ark of God was. And so we can, we can see this, that Eli at this time was actually at an old age. He was getting uh, close to the end of his, of his time being uh, in ministry. His eyes were old. He, he had bad vision and all this stuff. And then even Samuel was a young boy. Theologians believe that he was about 12 years old at this time. And as we, keep, as we uh, continue to read, we see right here when God calls Samuel. It says, then the Lord called Samuel. Samuel answered, here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, here I am. You called me. But Eli said, I didn't call you. Go back and lay down. So he went and laid down. And again, the Lord called Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, here I am. You called me. My son, Eli said, I did not call you. You're crazy. Go back and lay down. Leave me alone. He's saying, now Samuel, it's interesting right here, it says, Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. I think this is wild to me. This is incredible because this, this is a moment where Samuel is hearing the voice of God. God is speaking to him, calling out his name. And not only that, not to mention that it says in verse 7, now Samuel did not know the Lord. I think it's so important. I think it's so very important that we realize that Samuel did not know the Lord, that it was, his word was not revealed to him. So can I tell you this? That did you know you can be in church but not of the church? You can do all the church things. You can look like the church, act like the church. You can sing all the songs. You can have the tattoos on your arm. You can have the verses in your bio, but still not know the true and one God personally in your heart. You can do all the things but still never know what's happening. See, you could have a degree from the most prestigious college, have a divinity and a doctorate in divinity, and still completely miss the call of God, miss the understanding, and, he, and miss the voice that God is trying to say. See, your relationship with God is not based on how you dedicate your time. Your relationship with God is based on who your heart is dedicated to. It's not dedicated to how you spend your time or what works you do or being a good person. Who, what is your heart dedicated to? Is it dedicated to the Lord or is it dedicated to just looking like a Christian? See, Samuel was raised in, uh, with the priest Eli in the church. He did all the church things. He served. He, he even knew the word of God. But the scriptures expose a deeper level of intimacy between us and our Heavenly Father. See, I remember working in the oil fields, and, and if you work in the oil fields, you know it's a wild place out there. There's some crazy people. But I remember going out there as a new Christian and being like, yo, I'm going to come out here. I'm going to save the oil fields. I have my Bible, and it was awesome. But it was crazy because some of those guys that were wild, dirty, like crazy, knew the Word of God better than me but didn't serve Him. And so we can know, we can walk, we can do all these things, but if we don't know him, it's a whole nother game. As we continue reading, it says, A third time the Lord called Samuel. And Samuel got up 
and went to Eli and said, here I am, you called me. And Eli realized that the Lord was calling this boy. So Eli told Samuel, go and lie down. And if he calls you, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went down and laid down at his place. The Lord came and stood there. I feel like the Lord's like, come on, Samuel, hear me. You know, he got up. He said, I'm, I'm standing now. You got to hear me. The Lord came and stood there calling and said, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, speak, for your servant is listening. See, we know that Samuel did incredible, incredible things throughout his life after this moment. After this moment, Samuel did amazing things, and we, and we know Samuel went on to do incredible things for God, and he, he led the nation of Israel back to the heart of God, back to what God was calling him to do. He actually led the Israelites to take away all the, the, all the false gods that they were worshiping at the time, and he led them to a, a spiritual integrity in their lives. See, Samuel's willingness to listen and respond to God's voice as a young boy under the leadership of Eli was so important because it re reveals to us the importance of cultivating spiritual sensitivity to God's voice. Do we have spiritual sensitivity to what God is saying to us? Are we in tuned to the voice of God? Do you recognize the voice of God? It took three times for Eli the priest to recognize that God was calling. See, Jesus puts it like this in John 10, 27. He says, my sheep hear my voice. My sheep, they hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I think it's interesting that he says that my sheep hear my voice, and I know them. I often think, like, if I, if I hear his voice, then, then I'm going to know him. But he said, no, I know them. And it's this switch of this relationship that he is actively pursuing you. He wants to know you. He hears you. He hears your hurt. He knows your heart. He knows your pain. He knows the dysfunction that you're going through. He knows what your heart is breaking for. And he's saying, my sheep, I know them. I know their hurt. I know their pain. I know the dysfunction in their life. And what do they do? They follow after me. They listen to my voice. They hear me. They follow me. See, he is an active relationship with you, and he hears us. See, there are many reasons why we as, uh, as Christians or believers do not hear the voice of God. And today I want to share with you two points and reasons why we do not hear or how we can hear the voice of God. Tonight, if you're taking notes, write this down. The first thing you have to do to hear the voice of God is doing this. Number one, you have to recognize that God is speaking. You have to recognize that there is a God in the universe that knows your name. The creator of all this, all this world and universe, the king of kings and lord of lords, the great I am, knows your name. He knows your abilities. He knows your, your purpose. He knows your strengths. He knows you. Did you know that God is speaking to you? See, I've heard Pastor Jason say uh, time after time again that, that God does not have a speaking problem. We have a listening problem. We need to recognize that God is speaking in our lives, that God wants to direct you. God wants to guide you. God wants to give you strength. God wants to give you boldness. God wants to give you understanding for how to live this crazy life. But if we aren't in tune to the word of God, then we will never have the strength that we need. See, it took three times for Eli the priest to recognize who was speaking and we end up saying things like this. This is often what happens, why we don't hear the word of God. Why We, we often say, God, I, I don't know where God is. I can't hear him in my life. I don't know that he's moving. God's not doing this. Or it's, it's, we always end up saying things. It's hard for me to hear God when things are so crazy. My life is chaotic. I got kids. I got family. I got my work. I got the dysfunction in my work. I got finances. I got doctor's appointments. I got all these things, sports, family, all this and stress, and I'm lack of sleep, how can I hear God's voice in all that chaos? But this is what I want you to know, because this is a, an excuse that I've used, and it's an excuse that I believe all of us use in our daily life, that our life is too chaotic for us to hear God. But this is what I want you to know, that in that excuse, in that moment of saying, God, this is why I can't hear you. Or, God, this is why I haven't gone all, all, all in. This is why I haven't been baptized. Or this is why I haven't served on a team. In that thought right there, you're in a battle. In that thought of saying, God, I can't do this because of this chaos, 
you're in the battle. You are at war with the enemy. See, the enemy's goal is to, is to derail your relationship with God, is to distract you from what God has called you to do, from hearing that verse voice. So he's going to put things in your life to distract you so you don't hear the wisdom of God, so you don't hear the guidance of God. He's going to distract you, but the goal of the enemy is to distract you and derail your relationship with God, the one and only person that is going to give you the right advice to do the right thing. See, we serve a God. That wants to teach you how to be a godly husband and a godly wife. We serve a God that wants to teach you how to handle those difficult people in your, in your work. We serve a God that says and that he has a beautiful and perfect plan for you. But the enemy wants to lie to you and say you have chaos and dysfunction in your life because God is not real. Or you have chaos and dysfunction in your life and you don't hear God because he's forgotten about you. But that can't be farther from the truth. God is actively seeking you. God is actively pursuing you and wants a relationship with you. But we have to tune in to the word of God. We have to recognize that God is speaking. We have to recognize that there is a God that loves you, that knows your name and knows your hurts, that is calling out to you just like he said to Samuel, Samuel, Samuel. And we have to be willing to recognize that he's calling. Tonight, if you want to recognize the voice of God, you have to do the second one. And that is, you have to prioritize the voice of God. You have to prioritize the voice of God. Meaning, you have to prioritize God in your life. Prioritizing God's voice in your life involves making a conscious effort to listen to him above all other influences. Above everything else. Above the influence of culture above the influence of family, above the influence of comfort, above the influence of fear, of doubt, of worry, of all these things, above all influences, I have to allow God to influence me first. See, God has to be the filter in which I live my life. God has to be the filter, and when I make a decision, I, I put it through the filter of God, not the filter of my worries. I put it through the filter of God, not the filter of my fears. I filter my life through God. And in that way, I prioritize my life. See, we usually prioritize the loudest things in our life. But just because something is loud doesn't mean it's important. See, we have to prioritize God's voice in our life. We make a conscious effort, an intentional effort to know who God is. And you can do that in two ways. One way, you posture yourself to listen. You posture yourself to listen. So this is something that I have a hard time doing, man. Sitting still, we were just talking in the back how I got ADHD. I got to, like, move. I got to go crazy, you know. I'm going to test the cameras tonight. You know, like, I, I, like, we have to posture ourselves to listen. We have to posture our heart to say, hey, God, I'm expecting you to speak. And this might be hard for some of you guys because some of you guys may be just busy. You love busy work. You open up your, your calendar and show it off like it's a flex because it's full some of you need to start removing things off your calendar and start saying no to things and say yes to God more. But you might not be hearing God's voice because your life is so busy with things that you have filled it up with and not allowed God to speak. And some of you, on the other hand of that, you have to start saying, you have to start being a little bit quieter. Sometimes I feel like we pray too much and don't let God speak. We're saying, God, speak to me. God, speak to me. God, do this. I need this. And then we go about our day, and we don't allow God to actually speak. We say, God, I need this. God, would you do this in my life? Speak to me. Okay. And we don't give God a chance. We let that chaos come back into our life. We let that dysfunction come back into our life. We have to posture ourselves for the word of God. And then the other one is that we have to be in proximity. We have to be in proximity with the word of God. We have to be in proximity with God. Can I, this is one thing that I often hear people saying is that, man, I feel like God is so far from me. But can I tell you that if you feel like God is far from you, he didn't move, you did. You walked away from God. You turned your ear away from God. You turned your back and said, God, I can do it my way. But can we turn today and hear the voice of God and say, God, I'm willing to go your way. God, I want to walk in your way. God, I want to hear your voice. I want to do what you have called me to do. I want to be in proximity to you. 
See, the process requires cultivating a relationship with God, creating space for his voice in our life, and actively seeking his guidance in daily decisions. I think a lot of us choose not to hear God's voice because we're afraid of what he's going to say. We're afraid that he's going to call us into something that we don't believe that we can do. Or he's going to call us into something that we know we can't do. A.W. Tozer put this uh, incredible quote. It says, most Christians don't hear God's voice because we've already decided we aren't going to do what he says. That's tough. But man, is that so true. I wonder how many miraculous moments we have missed because we didn't tune our ears to the voice of God. I wonder if we have family members that don't know the name of Jesus because we have not listened to the voice of God. I wonder how many people in our circles do not know the love of God or needed encouragement at a time but did not get it because we were not obedient to the word of God. You may be scared of what God says when he speaks to you, but that's okay. It's normal. But that's why the angels would always say, do not be afraid when they had an encounter. But tonight, I want to encourage you to turn your ears to the Lord. And when you hear him, because he's speaking, when you hear him, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Can I pray for you? God, thank you so much, Lord for how incredible you are. God, that we would turn our ears to you, Lord. God, that we would not be afraid of what you are to say, but we would be bold through the boldness that you give us, Lord. God, let us hear your voice. Let us be your sheep and let us follow you. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray, amen. Amen, great job. Hello, amen, amen. Hi everyone, how's everybody doing tonight? So my name is Delilah, I'm one of the therapists here, and I just want to give a special shout out to our pastors and our leaders. They are incredible, and to say that we're blessed and spoiled is really an understatement. I'm very honored and grateful um, to be at this church and to be here because, I don't know if you noticed, I'm not a pastor, so if God can use me, God can use you, believe me, okay? Um, so tonight we're going to be talking about Ruth, and um, if you've been in church a while, you've probably heard the story of Ruth, but it starts out in Ruth 1.1, and it says, Now it came about in the days of when the judges governed that there was a famine in the land, and a man of Bethlehem in Judah went to reside in the land of Moab with his wife and his two sons. And maybe for some of you tonight, this is how your story has began where there was famine, where you looked around and there was more that you were lacking than what you had. And I'm here tonight to tell you that just because your story started a certain way doesn't mean it's destined to end that way. And so we see that through this famine, God repositions them. But their tragedy doesn't stop there. Unfortunately, we're not told why or how, but we learn that Naomi's husband dies, unfortunately, and she's left as a single mom of two kids. And then we're not told why or how, but her two sons die. And she's left as a widow and now a grieving mom with two daughters-in-law. And she gets to a place that maybe many of you have gotten to where you ask yourself, what do I do now? My life is filled with pain. I have all this suffering going on, and I don't know where to go. So it says in Ruth 1, 6 through 7, Then she arose with her daughters-in-law to return from the land of Moab because she heard in the land of Moab that the Lord had visited his people by giving them food. So she departed from the place where she was and her two daughter-in-laws with her, and they went on their way to return to the land of Judah. And so in modern-day terms and ver verbiage, this might be, hey, you know, I'm going through a hard time, and I hear that Christians have joy or Christians have peace, or people at Discovery, there's something going on there, so I'm going to go there. So just because God repositions you, you can't get stuck in what God called a temporary solution and make it a permanent home. You have to know when to return to the land of Judah, which Judah in Hebrew quite literally means praise. It's time to return to the land of praise. Don't get stuck in your sorrow and put up camp there. It's time to go back to the land of the Lord. And we see that when they get there, it goes on in Ruth 2, 2 through 3. 
and it says, And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, Please let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain, following one in whose eyes I might fa find favor. And she said to her, Go, my daughter. So she left and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers, and she happened to come to the portion of the field belonging to Boaz, who was part of the family of her deceased husband. And this point is so good because Ruth was desperate enough to be humble. See, to glean quite literally means to trail after the harvesters and to gather the scraps and the crumbs. So for her daily bread, she was working, and she was working for a very little bit. But she was humble enough to do the hard work. She was desperate enough to feed herself and to feed her family. So she gleaned in the field. And this word gleaning is also where we get the term gleaning knowledge from somebody, which means to patiently gather knowledge. Sometimes indirectly, you observe what they do, you learn how they speak, you watch, you watch what they say, and you're gathering all this knowledge. So my question to you tonight is what are you gleaning from? Who are you gleaning from? Are you remaining faithful in that? Are you too proud to learn from somebody you don't think you can learn from? Are you humble enough to be desperate? Ruth was. And in Ruth 2.11, it says, Boaz replied to her, um, all that you have done for your mother-in-law after the death of your husband has been fully reported to me. And how you left your father and your mother in the land of your birth, and you came to a people that you not, did not previously know. Ruth was faithful. And because of her faithfulness, Boaz took notice of her. And he saw her, and her character preceded her. The things that she did for her mother-in-law, the ways that she sacrificed, the ways that she worked, that went far beyond anything she could imagine, and it caught the eyes of Boaz. But just like Boaz saw her faithfulness, the Lord sees yours. So when you sacrifice, when you wake up early, when you love somebody that's hard to love, when you stay at a job and submit to a boss that you don't want to submit to, the Lord sees when you're faithful. The Lord sees when you do the right thing, even though it's the hard thing to do. The Lord sees you, and it's never a waste, and it's never for nothing. And it goes on to say in um, Ruth 2, 17, so she gleaned in the field in, in, until evening, and then she beat out the, what she had gleaned, and she gathered what was called an epa of barley. An epa of barley translates to about 29 to 30 pounds of barley. So she might have been gleaning for scraps, but it produced an abundance. And I think that that just shows the heart of God, that even when it feels like you're sacrificing and you're giving and you're working hard and maybe you're doing so much for what feels like so little, the Lord can take that little and make an abundance for you. And he will provide provision for you. He will provide um, prosperity for you, but it comes with hard work. And then Boaz tells her in Ruth 2, 8 through 11, listen carefully, my daughter. Do not go glean in another field furthermore. Do not go on from this one. Keep your eyes on the field in which you glean and go after them. We also know as readers that he kind of tells the servants a little bit, when you're, when you're harvesting your crops, go ahead and, your, your crops, go ahead and give her a little bit more. You know, so she didn't know that he was also being generous and that. But again, because of her faithfulness, he was providing for her. But she was faithful in the small things. And she gleaned for a little bit. And she was just, sorry. Um, she was faithful in the small things. And she stayed put in the field that she was called to. She didn't hop around from field to field trying to hustle for more. And maybe for some of you tonight, this is your sign Stay faithful in where God's called you. You don't have to hop from leader to leader or church to church or worship experience to worship experience. Stay faithful in the small things to the boss that you're under, to the workplace that you're at. I know it feels hard to stay faithful in a season where it feels like you're not reaping anything, but the Lord sees you, and it's not for nothing. Because for Ruth, ultimately, her faithfulness is what led to her redemption. It says in Ruth 4, 9 through 10, Then Boaz said to the elders and all the people, You are witnesses today that I have bought from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech and all that belonged to Kilian and Malon. Furthermore, I have required Ruth, Ruth the Moabite, the widow of Malon, to be a wife in order to raise up the name of the deceased on his inheritance. 
So even though Ruth was only gleaning for what felt like scraps and crumbs, it ultimately led to her redemption. It led to her not being ashamed anymore, her not being a widow anymore, her not living a life that is just filled with tragedy. Instead, she got her inheritance back. She got her redemption back, and it was from the small acts of faithfulness. And then it goes on in Ruth 4, 11 through 12. And all the people who were in the court and the elders said, we are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, both of whom built the house of Israel. Moreover, may your house be like the house of Perez, who Tamar bore to Judah through the descendants whom the Lord will give you by this woman. And what the Lord showed me is that term, may your house be like the house of Perez. So that name Perez in Hebrew quite literally means to burst forth, to break, or break through. So what they're telling them is may your house be a house of breakthrough. So your faithfulness, you're gleaning in a season where you feel like you're working for nothing. You're not hopping around from field to field and staying put and staying faithful to the things that you're calling to, you're called to. It's not only leading to your redemption, it's leading to your breakthrough. And then what we see, which is just everything in the Bible is just so detailed and it's so beautiful. But what you see is the breakthrough wasn't just for her. It was a breakthrough that was going to lead to a future legacy for her family. So I looked that up, the lineage from Perez that they pointed out, all the way to Boaz. And Perez means out of the breakthrough, and so it means to burst forth and breakthrough. Perez gave birth to Hezron, which means to be surrounded by a great wall. Hezron gave birth to Ram, which is high or senior. Ram gave birth to Amminadab, which is a people of willingness, generosity, and abundance. Amminadab gave birth to Nashan, which means bronze, serpent, and oracle. Nashan gave birth to Salmon, which means peace. Salmon gave birth to Boaz, which means strength and swiftness. Boaz gave birth to Obed, which means servant of God. And then Obed gave birth to Jesse, the Lord exists. And Jesse gives birth to King David, which means the Lord's beloved. And ultimately, this lineage would lead to the Christ. And it all started with Ruth's faithfulness to glean in a field that looked like crumbs, to stay faithful in a land where she was a foreigner to, to not hop around and try to hustle for more, but just listen to when the master told her to stay put. And it all started to from Naomi returning to the house of praise and not staying stuck in the land of her grief and her tragedy. So what you do in this season matters. It matters not just for you and your breakthrough, but it matters for the house that's going to come from you. It matters from the legacy that's going to come from you. So stay faithful into the things that God's calling you to, even when it's hard because the Lord sees you. Let me pray. So let's pray. Dear God, we come before you, Lord, and we just thank you that your eyes are always on us, Lord, that you see us when we do the hard thing. You see us when we choose the hard thing. You see us when our character feels hard to uphold, God, but you honor that, Lord. I pray for any person that has walked away from you, even if the distance feels great. I hope that they see that the way back to you is always just one step. I pray that they are faithful to the things that they're, you're calling them to, even if it feels hard, even if it feels exhausting. Lord, you see them. We love you and we praise you. I pray for this church right now that you would uplift every single heart in here, that you would give them a new wind of strength, a new wind of courage, a new wind of, of, of faithfulness, Lord, because we know that the breakthrough is coming. We know that the legacy is coming. We know that our salvation is coming. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Wasn't that just an amazing word, you guys? Man, my name is Stephen Bernal. I am the junior high director and videographer here at Discovery Church. And I am just so excited to be given this opportunity just by our amazing pastors, Pastor Jason and Veronica. I am just super thankful for their leadership, their mentorship, and their unstoppable vision for our church. And I'm just really excited today because I really have a, a, just a preaching that's uh, uh, close to my heart, something that I feel like God revealed to me months ago, and it, and it took me on this journey that, that really took me to the next level in my faith. And what I'm calling it is wear your armor. Wear your armor. Because here's the thing, church. I don't know if you know, 
but there's a fight going around us. Every day there's a fight. And that there's a fight that we have to be prepared for, that we have to be armored up. And the thing is, is that we live in a very imperfect world. We live in a broken world. You know what? I'm reminded every day of how imperfect our world is. Every week. I'm reminded when I see these gas prices. I'm like, Lord, is this from you? Just the other week, me and my wife, we, we went to the store, and I just went to buy some, some deodorant, some hygiene stuff to stock up. And I probably bought five or six things all fit in my hand, and it was over $60. And I almost rebuked the cashier person. I was like, in Jesus' name, be gone. Get behind me, Satan. But as we know, our world is just imperfect. It's broken. Matter of fact, in the word, it actually says that we are promised to face trials. That we are promised to face struggles. And because of that, we need to be armored up. We need to be prepared. And so the thing is, though, is our world may be imperfect. We may be struggling. But how many know that God gave us the tools to conquer it? How many of us know that God gave us the tools necessary and he gave us the word, the word of truth to conquer it? Man, I, I just love that earlier this year we actually did a, a book sermon study of the book of Ephesians. And I love to jump in Ephesians 6. It talks about the armor of God. And it says, verse 10, finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor to God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, and against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand firm. Church, it's, it's here in the word that it says we need to be armored up. We need to be prepared. A fool is someone who's just going to show up in the battlefield with flip-flops and a tank top. We need to be prepared. We need to be equipped. And, but here's the thing is that we may have the armor on, but it may not be the armor God wants. We could be wearing the wrong type of armor. And I love to jump in the story of David. See, in, the, in David, we, we know him as uh, the second king of Israel, the man after God's own heart. And what I'm going to get at today is that he was the man who slayed Goliath. Not as a man, not as a soldier, but as a young shepherd boy. See, in 1 Samuel 17, 38 through 39, David is actually in the tent with King Saul. And he's saying, David, you have no armor. You have shepherd clothes. It's time I armor you up. I'm going to give you my own personal armor. I'm going to give you my sword. It says in 38, then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put a coat of armor around him, a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened his sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he was not used to them. David says, I cannot go in these because I am not used to them. So he took them off. You see, when, when I see the story, I just picture a young boy getting dressed, armored. There's probably servants helping him. They're putting, you know, they're, they're fastening his belt. They're, they're getting a sword on his waist. They're putting this big old breastplate on him. And I just imagine each piece of armor that they're putting on him, David's like, what are we doing? This is, this is not fit for me. And, and church, I, I think that's in a lot of our cases. See, the, the truth is, is that wearing someone else's armor is going to slow us down. It's going to limit us. Can you imagine what it would look like if we prepared for armor, we're wearing it, our, our, our shoes are too, too big, our pants are too big, our breastplate's too big, everything, the sword, the shield, the helmet's too big. It looked like that you show up to the devil and he's like, who am I, who am I fighting, Shaquille O'Neal? What's, what's going on? We think we're armored up. We think we're prepared for the fight. We're prepared for the battle. But really, we're just limiting ourselves. We're limiting our mobility. And the connection that I want to make today is that the armor that was not his is because it was looking from someone else. See, sometimes in our lives, we look at other people's armor. We look at their journey. We look at their gifts. We see what they're doing. And we get distracted. We start to covet. We start to grow frustrated with ourselves like, man, why, why, why can't I do that like they do? Why can't I do this like they do? And you see, we're so focused on someone else's journey, we're missing what God wants to do in ours. 
church. You see, the, the enemy, he, he's deceptive. He's deceitful. He's been doing it since the fall of man. It's the same tricks. He gets in our heads. He lies to us. He has us so caught up in other people's journey, we miss what God wants to do. And, he, and I want to make a clear distinction. I'm not saying because someone else is in a small group, you don't go to a small group. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying because someone's getting their daily bread, their scripture, the breath of life every morning, you shouldn't do the same. I'm saying we shouldn't compare what God wants to bring to ourselves uniquely. We are fearfully, wonderfully made. We all have a unique design, a unique calling that God breathed inside of us. That when he formed us in our mother's womb, God said, you are going to do this. You're going to bring people into the family of Christ and you're going to do this. You're going to love on people. You're going to pray over people in a way that, people, that, that, that inspires people. You're going to be a worshiper, that your voice will lead people to surrenderance to me. See, this, this is why I love uh, Discovery Tracks. We, we, have this, we have track two coming up, and it's so powerful because in this class, you discover your God-given purpose, your potential, your spiritual giftings. That you get to learn, you get to discover that, no, God created me. I have a calling on my life. That if I have breath in my lungs, that there is stuff God wants me to do to change the world, to love the world. You see, God has so much for us. But we're too busy looking around. We're, we're, we're comparing the people around us. When God said, I didn't bring them around you to compare, but to bring life. Because here's the thing, church. Comparison is the thief of joy. But inspiration is a breath of life. So when you look at those around you, you should be drawing inspiration. You should be ironing, sharpening iron. That you should be building upon one another. You shouldn't be comparing yourselves what you can and can't do. You should be inspiring like, brother, I see this in you. I want that fire inside of me. See, God has so much more for our life. To be, so, to, to be too busy to look in the other lane. God says, I have fearfully made you son of God, daughter of God. You have gifts, you have talents. You have an armor that's uniquely made for you to prepare against the fight. That when the enemy comes, and he will come, you will be victorious. Because I already got the victory. Church. It's time that we put on our own armor, that we have grace upon ourselves, that we're not comparing left and right, but we're being inspired by the brothers and sisters in Christ around us. Can I pray that over you guys? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I just thank you, God. I thank you, Lord, for, for God, for giving us unique gifts, God, a calling, new anointings, God. To further your kingdom, Lord, I pray over each and every single person here today, God, that, Lord, they know that you have a mission and calling that's unique to them. That the brothers and sisters around them are to build them up and lift them up, Father God. Lord, I pray over each and every heart today, God, that they pursue you, they chase you, and they put on their armor. In Jesus' name. Hey, thank you for watching the Discovery Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join the Discovery Online family every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream event and share it with a friend. You can also support the ministry by clicking the Give button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Jesus Christ. Thank you again for watching. Go love God, love each other, and change the world.